Good to be with you guys this morning. Good to worship with you. Uh, and if we've not met, my name's Kevin. I'm one of the elders uh, here. Uh, get the privilege of speaking here on a regular basis. But I am one of dozens and dozens of other uh, leaders that are part of this movement, this church. Uh, and uh, uh, it, we put them inside of your bulletin uh, just as a matter of recognition, uh, not just for who they are specifically, uh, but to continually communicate uh, uh, that we believe in the plurality of leadership here at the church. Uh, Simon is uh, an example of that. He and Sarah are tremendous leaders for us, and uh, uh, we want to say thank you to them for all that they do for us on a regular basis. Uh, and if you are new, I'd love to meet you. I'm, one thing I have grown to really like about this setup we've been, it's not quite a year yet we've been in the auditorium, but one of the benefits I hadn't considered is that I get a chance when I stand there, I can grab everybody walking out. So unless you just sneak out the back door uh, and you're newer, I'm going to try to make eye contact with you. But would love to meet you if we've not met. I've uh, got a little gift for you over there, too. Um, uh, I wanted to start today almost in the identical way that I started last week uh, uh, about something that we're going to do a little later in the service. And I do this for a couple of reasons, because I think when you do something new and something important, it's important to repeat it, talk about why you do it, the value for it. Uh, and two, some of you weren't here last week, and so this is a very practical reason. Uh, but what we're doing, um, that's not really different. We've done this uh, a lot, uh, but we feel like we're in the season we're in right now uh, uh, to make a, I don't want to say a shift, but a, a greater emphasis on the ministry of prayer in our church. Um, and and you, you, you don't have to be here more than five minutes, and somebody's got a microphone right here, and the word prayer comes out of their mouth. Um, but we want, we mean specifically the ministry of personal prayer uh, and the opportunity for us to minister to one another, something we do in settings throughout the week, something we do here fairly regularly, um, but we feel like we need to make that investment on Sundays. And again, uh, Sundays are not the only thing that go on around here. We do church all week long, but I, I think Sundays are special and unique. Uh, in some ways, I'll, I'll be honest, sometimes I think we take Sundays for granted right? That uh, the opportunity that we have to come together and spend time corporately uh, doing what we do, we, what we just did, we told Jesus how much we loved him. It's our chance to speak to him about worship, about our love for him, uh, where we share the word, what I'm about to do, uh, where we share in communion, both individually and corporately, uh, but also an opportunity to hear from the Lord. We, we, we have a strong belief that the Holy Spirit is alive and active, that he did not cease with his voice with the time of the apostles, uh, but that the Spirit wants to speak to us. And so, uh, obviously, you know, that is about our discipleship journey and us learning how to pray and to hear from the Spirit and that the Spirit would speak to us, but also making space for that. Uh, and that we want you to, and I'm going to use a word I want to be careful with here, because I think it means different things to some people. We want you to experience the presence of God. God is everywhere all the time, so this isn't about coming to hear in this old gymnasium, like he exclusively exists here. But we want to make space on our Sunday mornings for you to experience that presence. And, 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 I, and I want us to, to, to do that because I believe we're at a time and a place, not just as a nation, but as a people, but in, certainly at our church, uh, that I believe the Holy Spirit wants to speak even more prophetically amongst us. I, I believe there are many that have a special gifting and an anointing for that prophetic gift. And that the Lord wants you to step out into that. Last week when we did this prayer and ministry time, I saw a few of you courageously walking over and praying for people. They feeling led to go and pray with them about something or something you may not have known that they were struggling with, but you did. And we want to continue to do that. And so today, like we did last week, and we'll continue to do, after the sermon today, uh, Daryl will come up. He'll set up our communion time. We want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to to really count that time as special and unique as we consider what happened there on Calvary. And then we roll into the ministry time where Kyle's going to come up, play a little bit more of an acoustical set. But the, the, the environment is much more conducive, I think, to more interactive prayer, praying for each other. The prayer team will be in the back. Uh, they're available to be prayed with. And last week, I saw more people getting prayed for than I had in quite a while. And so if that's the only outcome of this change, I think that's a great outcome because we believe prayer moves. We, we believe that the Lord wants to hear from us. And I especially believe, 
I'm certain of this, God wants to speak to you. And, and so we want to make sure that you are exercising those spiritual muscles. And so today after this message, we'll do that. I'm just setting you up early uh, because I want you to know that. And I want you, especially again, those that are feeling led to pray for other people to start to build up that courage. All right. Now, uh, we've been in a series uh, that, frankly, is very related to that. We're calling one anothering. One of the one anotherings, I think it's James 5, 15, James 16, where James tells us to pray for one another. So we're just following his instruction. Uh, but this one anothering series is, is about the uniqueness of the local church, the, the ecclesia, the gathering, this thing that was officially, if you want to call it that, started and moved at Pentecost, but, but is unique in, in its application of care both inside the body of Christ and, and outside the body. I, I'll give you a little heads up. Uh, or I think November 7th, we're going to do a little bit of a special thing. I've got a friend who's an expert in church history, uh, and he's going to come, and I'm going to interview him. And we're going to talk about the unique and special nature of the church, H how this thing that you and I are part of today that's been around for 2,000 years, where it's been, what it's done, and why it's so special and for some of us, why we need to really be certain to consider the whole of church history to help us really translate what's going on in our lives today, right? And so we, we believe that the church is a special thing. It's a special place. We know that Christ is returning for the church. And as we're part of that church today, that one of the things we do is we do these one another rings. We, we do these things of care. There are some things we don't do that the, the, the phrase, the Greek word is mentioned 100 times, 59 of those are directives or, or things to not do, but in its total, it's, it's Jesus and James and John and, and the writer of Hebrews telling us how to do these things for each other, and that as we support each other in our discipleship journey, in our getting to know Jesus, and it centers around that first commandment that we talked about in week one, where Jesus said to love one another. He called it a new command that we love one another. In that second week, we talk about the very needed and necessary one anothering of the word to be kind to one another and how that kindness really, I think, breaks through the culture of our day to day and how kindness is so important. And last week, we talked about that uh, Paul's uh, directive for us to bear each other's burdens or bear one another's burdens and, and talked about how it is Caring for each other in difficult times is an expressed mark of what disciples do for each other. And then also dealt with that weird tension that Paul mentioned, as we talked about it last week, that we're to bear each other's burdens, but each one of us is to carry our own load. It was a very important distinction for us because in our ministries of Celebrate Recovery and the ministry of Joshua's Place, as we help those that are struggling in poverty or those that are struggling in addiction or codependency or some hurt habit or hang up, that we have to ask the important questions that Jesus asked in John 5 of the person that he went on to heal that hadn't walked is, do you want help or do you want to get well? Do you want help or do you want to get well? Because sometimes those are two different things. And so we want to be in the business of helping people get well is what the question Jesus asked the person who hadn't walked. And so we want to bear the burdens, these long time, difficult things that would, all of us need help with but that we need to do it in a way that we don't bring help that hurts. And so you can see where some of these things are directives, but they're not easy. That our human nature might be to move in one direction, but the nuance of how that is manifest is very reliant on what I closed out last week's message with, is that the real, the, the real discipline about how it is that we would bear each other's burdens and care for one another and walk through the tension of should we help or should we help get well is community, being in community. Simon mentioned it today, that the idea that beyond just a Sunday gathering or beyond just a, you know, a, a, a social connection, that we're called to, to be in relationship and in connection with each other that allows for spaces of not just prayer and openness, but of vulnerability and for care. And so uh, it's why we are so focused on inviting you into those deeper relationships outside of just Sunday morning. And so these one anotherings are about the uniqueness of the local church and frankly an opportunity and a benefit that we all have as being part of the church, that all these one anotherings aren't just something that we're to do, but they're one anotherings that we benefit from. Somebody else will be one anothering us in that time of need or crisis or opportunity for, for growth. And so 
Uh, it's, it's been a good series that way. I think we'll probably go on for two or three more weeks before we head into, uh, it's into our holiday series. Uh, a couple special things there. Stay tuned for that. Now, drawing from my experience in business, I, uh, I, I think there's this notable trend that's not really a new thing, but it's, there's some language around it that I hear a lot as it relates to organizational growth, organizational health, organizational maturity. And a lot is made today, for those of you that are in the business sector, around this issue of culture. And, and I won't call it a buzzword because it's not a new idea. Culture has been an important thing in every organization. And when I talk about organization, I mean it in, of course, the business sector. I mean it in the religious sector, in churches or in nonprofits. A lot is made about the culture of teams when you talk about professional sports or collegiate sports, that culture is very important. And culture are those things about the organization that drive its attitudes and its behavior. It's the, it, what causes us to think a certain way and believe a certain way about that organization, which, oh, by the way, includes things like family and marriage, right? But culture is important. And as I think about what the, 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 the key elements of what culture is, what I have found in the cultures and the organizations that I've been part of that I would consider mature and healthy and impactful, one of the most significant things to find and the hardest things to live out is to have a culture of feedback. That within a healthy culture, the idea that those that are part of that organization, team, or family, that there is a healthy respect and value for this idea of delivering truth, giving each other feedback about whatever the mission of that organization is. I also find that it's one of the most difficult things for us to learn and to do because we're so resistant to that. That as much as a healthy culture of an organization depends on it, as much as good relationships depend on it, it's one of the things that I think are the hardest to find. And in my experience as a manager and as a leader, when I hire people into roles, whether it's at Joshua's Place or here at the church or the companies that I'm involved with, it's, it's the hardest thing to find. That someone that's really not just willing, but able to have hard conversations. Do we, do we have a value and appreciation for the truth at a level to where I'm willing to engage it, and I'm willing to engage it in a way that brings not just the truth, but brings restoration and brings a better outcome. And so in business, the better outcome is profitability, right? Productivity and improvement of processes. In the church world, it's a little different, in the nonprofit, and certainly as family. So, so the measurements are going to be different, but the idea is that within that organizational culture, that we, we hope to have this value and appreciation for feedback and truth to be at the very center of it, and I think it's the hardest to find, and it's, you know, there's no secret as to why that's hard. Many of us have been on the end of some very bad and poorly executed feedback sessions, right? We've all worked for that boss that, frankly, didn't mind giving feedback. They love to tell you how they thought. They love to tell you what a bad job you were doing. They love to give you the opinion of the truth that they saw it and that how it was you were supposed to be part of that truth. And so having been sometimes many of us victims of bad feedback and what we would, we would consider probably ill-timed or ill-executed feedback sessions, there's no doubt that we all want to shy away from it a little bit, but the reality is it is so necessary. And frankly, it's a skill and value that just has to be grown and developed over time. What I love about the scriptures and my opportunity that I get to teach the scriptures now for the past several years is that what I knew in life before I had an appreciation for scripture, which was the better part of 30 years, as I've come to know the scriptures more, that it's, it's so, I don't know why it should be awakening me, it's this ancient truth, it goes back to the beginning, literally, and it tells us about the end, but that scripture is comprehensive in its ability to deal with not just the huge parts, like where did we come from? The final parts about where we're heading, but about the, the parts of our life that get down to just basic relationships and wisdom that is eternal and an ancient. And today's topic is one of those because it, it really is one of those topics that has such broad application that there's wisdom that I think we can benefit not just from our relationship with God, but our relationship with each other as we look to one another. And so I'm going to take you today to the book of Colossians. We're going to get our one anothering from today. 
And if you've read the book of Colossians, you know it's a, a letter written by the Apostle Paul. This is one of his, what they would call the prison letters, where he writes it from Rome while he's in prison. And he's writing to the church in Coloss, and he's dealing with a heresy. So like a lot of Paul's letters, there was a problem in that church, and he's writing this letter to deal with the problem. The interesting thing, I think, it's interesting to me this week, as I've studied it a little bit deeper, that Paul is dealing mostly, there's only four chapters in the book of Colossians, and for most of it, he's dealing with these heretical elements within that church, and he's wanting to get things straight. But then in chapter 3, which is where we're going to get our today's one anothering from, as he kind of takes this break, and he starts to paint this picture of what we would call Christian living. What does it look like to be a follower of Jesus in our relationships and our activities and our attitudes? So there's kind of this, this broader view. And so if you just read chapter 3, you may not realize that this is a, a letter that Paul's writing to, frankly, to, to, to really bring some hard truths to a group of people. And in this section of chapter 3, he actually started off this part of the passage. And by the way, Paul didn't write it in chapters. This was just one letter that he wrote. We came later and added the chapters to it. But in this section of what we now know to be chapter 3, he's talking about keeping the peace. He's talking about how we should care and love for one each other and how peace is a prominent outcome that we're looking for. In the middle of that, he delivers us this one anothering about feedback that if we're not careful, we might think, would do anything but bring peace. And here's today's one another in Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. So Paul starts off by saying, we didn't read it, I want you to be in peace. And the way I want you to do it is I want you to admonish one another. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I've been in those sessions where I've been admonished, and the last thing that was going on was there wasn't a whole lot of peacekeeping going on. What I think about Paul is telling us here is there is a way that we will and could and should admonish each other that isn't about hurting one another. In fact, it's the opposite, and that there's actually two instructions here, because Paul is saying that we should teach and admonish. So the, of those two, I think the teaching part is a little more obvious, right? Teaching is about imparting knowledge. So part of this one anothering relationship, part about being in the church, the fellowship of believer, is an exchange of information. It's what we did this morning at 9.30, or actually I think the, the pre-pre-session starts at 8.30, uh, where, where we teach from the scriptures. And it's Daryl delivering truth, but it's also the group sharing with each other, and there is training and teaching going on. I think those are the kind of things that Paul's talking about. And then he uses the word that we now translate as admonish. And on its surface, I think admonish feels like one of those things that's just always going to be bad, right? <laughs> Has anybody here ever been admonished and you come out feeling good about it? If you have, it's probably a more rare experience. But what we really know to, about the, the, the original Greek here, and there, it's used seven or eight other times in the New Testament, and a couple of times it's translated, depending on the translation you use with, is admonishment. But other times it's translated as warn or exhort. So today, as we talk about the one anothering of admonishment, I want us to do a, as best we can to put it out of our mind that this is a negative thing, it's a bad thing, or that it's just purely in and of itself critical. It can be critical, but the outcome that we're looking for is about caution and about warning. I, I think those words are probably a little bit more helpful for us to see that it's a good thing and might, in fact, bring us to where we're a little bit more willing to do it for each other. And frankly, a little bit more willing to receive it on our end. And, and, and I just want us to probably normalize at some level that this, this process of discipleship that we're called to, because remember our, our mission is we're going to love God and we're going to love others, right? Those, those, are the, those are the centering parts of the commission, the great commandments that drive who we are as a village church. But the third part of that is to make disciples and that making disciples isn't just about the informational exchange, it isn't just about us saying, this is what we believe about the Bible. You should believe this same way and teach other peoples to believe too. But it's about what Paul is talking about in chapter 3 of Colossians. It's about the Christian life. How do we live this ancient and eternal truth in today's world? And maybe you've done it differently, but in my attempt to be a disciple of Jesus, there's been lots of times when I didn't do it well. There's been lots of ways where my belief was in alignment, but my attitudes and behaviors, the thing I brought to it, needed warning. It needed caution. 
It needed critique. And so I think it's in that setting that Paul highlights and brings out this, and, and, and my, again, my, my wording for that would be to try to normalize the idea that in the disciple-making process, warning, caution, admonishment is normal. It's going to be something that we need to receive, and it's going to be something that as followers of Jesus, we're going to need to do. Well, if you're reluctant to admonish, you're normal. That's a good thing. Matter of fact, I'm always cautious <laughs> about the person that's very eager. I know you know somebody like that, right? They're really eager that everything that comes up needs to be a confrontation. They are quick to say, we need to talk with that person. We need to confront that person. And I used to, as part of my responsibilities at the vineyard, uh, would work with the teams that handled the security. We, it was a pretty big church, and so we had a pretty big security team. Inevitably, and it happened several times, we would have people that wanted to be part of the security team, and they would ask questions like, do I get a shirt that says security on it, and can I carry my gun, right? <laughs> Those were two ways to not get on the security team at church, was to be that eager. I think likewise, when we think about admonishments and warning and caution, is that I'm always a little reserved about the person that really likes it, the person that's really eager, because it's not that I don't want you to appreciate the outcome of a good admonishment, but I think we have to break, bring into it the kind of sensitivity of knowing that more often than not, if we don't bring that kind of sensitivity, it's going to go poorly, and in fact, we can hurt people. And so eagerness is something we need to be cautious about, although I know at the root of that might be the pursuit of truth. The outcome may not be what our desire is. Despite that... We see Jesus using this. We see Jesus talking about this value in relationships. And in, in, in Luke 17, uh, Jesus says, uh, So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. And we certainly see in the, in the stories of Jesus and what's recorded to us in the Gospels, many times Jesus rebuking and admonishing people. He was not shy for telling the truth, and he would certainly, for some, certainly the more religious, the pharisaical types, he would deliver it in a more stern way on others where it might seem more obvious, maybe the woman at the well or the prostitutes that he'd run into, that it might be a good situation to really hit them hard. He was very gentle in his approach, very grace-filled. But either way, he would say to them, to the Pharisees, you brood of vipers, you whitewashed tombs, he would be direct, and to the prostitute, he would say, hey, go sin no more. Either one of them, both of them are rebukes, both of them are redirections, both of them are cautions or admonishments, and Jesus never shied away from it. And so we have to normalize that in the, in the discipleship process, and it's what Matthew 18 is so much about when it talks about how it is we manage conflict within the church, where if we're offended or if someone has fallen into sin, that we, we need to go and talk to that person. That it's not an option for us just to say, well, they're really sideways right now. Let's leave them off on their own. But we've got a requirement to do that. And Matthew 18 outlines the three steps that we do that. That's a whole other message. Later in the book of Revelation and, and uh, John's writing from the Isle of Patmos, he, in chapter 3, Jesus is talking to churches at the time. And in chapter 3, later on, He's talking to the church in Laodicea, and La the church in Laodicea had gotten pretty sideways because of, we don't know exactly why, but Jesus specifically mentions their love for prosperity and kind of gives this overtone of greed and luxury that's going on, and he warns them. He said, I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And so we see that the church of Laodicea is not in good standing with Jesus, and in doing that, Jesus, he, he's correcting them, but he gives the overreaching heart behind what he's doing, something that I think is instructive today as we consider what admonishment and caution looks like when he says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Now, I know all of us, our eight-year-old version of ourselves, never believe that, right? Because that's the kind of stuff our parents would tell us. I'm doing this because I love you. But then as we grew up to be parents, we understand what Jesus is saying here, right? That part of the affection and love that a parent has for a child is rebuke, is caution, is admonishment, is discipline. Now, could we all do that perfectly and with the right hearts? I didn't. Maybe you guys did. But what Jesus is saying is that there's a time and a place where correction and caution and redirection is required, but it's because I love you. 
It's, it's what we, we see in the, 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 the story of the, of the parable of the vines, where Jesus is talking about the, the vine dresser, and the vine dresser, of course, is God, and that there are times when those that need to be pruned... There's a pruning process. We could, we, could, we could really identify that with its kind of discipline. And what the outcome of that isn't that the vine dresser is mad at the vine, but he wants the vine to be more productive. And at times there's a lifting up and there's a cutting off. There's a pruning that has to happen. And so many times as we go through difficult times and we're, we're, you know, we're wondering, Lord, are you there? Do you care about me? I, I'm really struggling right now. And and what's happening is we assume that he might be mad at us, but the reality is in those times, it's not that we're being, we're being pulled away from God, but there's a pruning process. And I'm, I've never been a tree or a plant, but I'm imagining it doesn't feel good if they had feelings, right? So we've got to, we've got to set aside our feelings aside those moments and realize that God is doing things in us because he loves us and that discipline is the operative part of disciple making and that many times that's part of the process and and it doesn't make it any easier okay i didn't make you feel any better but at least you know it has purpose that when god is disciplining you when jesus is rebuking us it's because he loves us and we've got to start from there so when we talk about this tension between those who avoid conflict and avoid admonishment at all costs i think that's a large group of people and I think there are a few that really enjoy it, probably less, that maybe don't do it as well. H- how do we find that middle, that healthy middle, a- as it relates to what's the right approach, what's the right way for me to bring admonishment to my relationships and for those that I'm responsible for, those that God has called me to? And I think the key there is in the second half of Colossians 3.16, when, when Paul says, teach and admonish one another, and then he uses this phrase, with all wisdom, with all wisdom. So I think Paul is giving us, he's given us the directive here, the what, but I think he's also given us the how. And in that wisdom, I think that is the most critical part of how we approach these issues of caution and admonishment, because if there's something that I want to, I feel like Eddie's gotten off the track on something, that as I go to him, yeah, Randy says, yeah, no kidding, great example, (laughs) But as I go to him, if I'm not bringing wisdom to that, I have more potential of doing harm to Eddie than I do in actually helping him. And so what does that wisdom look like? We're going to go to the book of James. I call James, this is my paraphrase, so don't repeat it because it's probably, it's not, it's not been subjected to peer review yet. I call James the book of wisdom for the New Testament. And I, I, I love the wisdom that we get from Solomon and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, but I read the book of James, and it's just filled with this practical wisdom about what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus in the New Covenant era. And in that time, in that wisdom, uh, James talks about two different kinds of wisdoms, and I think these two kinds of wisdoms give us the bookends that we ought to consider when Paul's saying, I want you to bring wisdom to this admonishment. Let's look at a good and a bad example. First of all, let's talk about the bad example in verse 13 of James 3. But if you harbor bitter, and, bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Wow. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. And so as we consider our admonishment role, whether it's somebody admonishing us or us being called to caution and warn them, I think James gives us a good kind of a clearinghouse for how our hearts ought to be prepared, that if any of these things are going on, am I going to the person out of envy? Am I going to them out of competitiveness? Am I going to them out of anger? Well, these are all bad ways to approach somebody, so that's not the wisdom we're kind of talking about. So what is the right wisdom? Let's go to verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So as we consider the wisdom, I want you to go to James at 3.17, measure your affections and your attitudes at that point and say, is it lining up with that? Or if you're considering not admonishing somebody out of a concern or fear of the conflict, I want you to take note of the language that James uses here that he doesn't say peacekeepers, he says peacemakers. 
And I, I think there's a big difference between peacekeepers and peacemakers, right? So for, for those that are a little bit conflict averse, that there are times when we're clearly called to engage a relationship in our life, a marriage relationship, one of our rebellious kids, a co-worker, uh, wh- whatever the situation, and we just avoid it because we want to keep the peace. Well, does that ever really work? It works in the moment, right? We avoid the conflict. If our goal is to not have conflict, peacekeeping works. But if we want to be peacemakers, if we want the kind of righteous peace that is being talked about here, sometimes we've got to go into that danger zone. We've got to do the heavy lifting. We've got to prepare our hearts. We've got to pray. We've got to make sure that the relationship exists, that we bring the kind of truth into this that's going to help that person. And so if what you hear out of me today is that admonishment is hard, and so I want to avoid it all at all costs, you might be a peacekeeper, but the Lord has called you to be a peacemaker, and so the, you may have more work to do as you consider the relationships in your life. So if you're interested in doing that, on the back of your bulletin, I have what I would consider the three keys, the three keys to delivering these hard truths. If, if you're in a trusted relationship, If you're in a a place where you're an influence on somebody else's life, again, obviously your children, that would count. Your marriage, that's going to count. Co-workers, and especially here in the body of Christ, if God has called me to bring caution, to bring a word of admonishment, even to bring criticism into a relationship, here are the three keys that I think we've got to consider. And I put it on your bulletin because you may want to take it home with you the next time this comes up and think about it. But the first key is what I would call motivation. Motivation. Why am I admonishing? What's the goal? And there again, I think that's, the, that's where the big difference is But when you start talking about secular or business organizations versus those that are, are the church or certainly more family relationships, that it's easy in a business that the goal is somebody to do better. Better performance, better productivity, better profit in the business world, and I think that's changed over the years, but at times that can feel like that's not enough, but I can at least tell you that in your families and in the church that our motivation has to be much deeper than that, that our motivation really has to be about restoration and fullness and maturity and completion, and that while we might say that our motivation is just to tell the truth, are we telling the truth in a way that's receivable? And a way that that person is going to know that we, in fact, do what the Apostle Paul talks about in Ephesians 4, verse 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head of that Christ, uh, that is Christ. So, So Paul's raising this value that truth has to be part of the body of Christ. The ligaments that hold it together, we are are built around this idea that we have to be able to share truth. But in the sharing of the truth, we can't just say it's the truth, you have to receive it. Our motivation has to be love. So if God is calling you into an admonishing of someone else, into a word of caution, we have work to do that's beyond the second thing. It's much more about our own heart. We've got to prepare ourselves for it. But the second thing beyond motivation is the method how we actually do it. And in the method, I think we can borrow from Jesus' teaching in places like Matthew 18. That if I'm going to admonish somebody, someone, Facebook probably isn't the place to do it, right? <laughs> or for that matter, anywhere in public. This just needs to be a very private thing between you and that person because if our goal is that whatever that caution and warning is, that you would help that person redirect onto a better path and that they don't have to filter this through embarrassment, or betrayal. That they understand that one, your motivation is love, and that the way that you do that is because you really have a desire to see them in a better place. Now that method requires that we're not making withdrawals from an empty bank account. (laughs) That if we're going to admonish someone that we have no relationship with, or we've not invested ever or or at least recently into them in a positive way, do we then have the ability to make a potential withdrawal? And so when I'm correcting or rebuking or bringing the admonishment, is there a relationship that exists? Do they trust me? And do they trust me because I have made investments and deposits into that relationship that had nothing to do with criticism, that had nothing to do with caution and warning? 
And again, I'll use our relationship with our children as an example of that. If all we told our kids was what they did poorly, is the outcome, is their wholeness and completeness going to be fully as opposed to we make the investments in most of the conversations and the time we spend is about encouraging and lifting them up. And on occasion, we have to redirect. I think our adult relationships are the same way. So in our method, have we spent the time? Have we made the investment? The other part about that method, and I think this is certainly the case in adult relationship, is, is there permission? Do you have permission to speak into that person's life? I think the obvious way to check is to ask them, hey, can I talk to you about something very difficult, right? And I've said to managers throughout the years as I talk about hard conversations and I talk about the, the idea of what I would call receivable truth. Is your goal here to just get this off of your chest and say what you want? Or is the, is the goal here to get them to a place of awakening and truth to where they would change as individuals as a result of it? And if the answer to that is yes, then I think the key is permission in our method. And what I've said is that there's only two ways that any of us receive feedback. One is permission. The other one is authority. But authority never really works. It's my belief, it's been my experience, that mostly that feedback that I've received has, has, has lasted and has planted, or the feedback that I have given, is only through permission. And that what that means is that it can't be just a hit-and-run kind of admonishment. Again, we go back to this, have I invested in that relationship? Is there deposits made in that account? And is that person I'm with at a place to where they're willing to receive it? Because if they don't trust me, or if there's no relationship there, then I'm just saying it to make myself feel better. There's nothing about what I'm about to deliver to them that's going to help or change their reality, their outcome. And again, that goes back to point number one, our motivation has to be right. So the first key is motivation, the second key is method, and the final key is the one that you would probably think more obvious and you might jump to more quickly, is the message itself. Motivation, method, and message. What am I saying? <laughs> I, you know, and, and I want us to start there because there's really no point in doing this if we don't really have a message to deliver to somebody, but the obvious thing, is that message required? Is it true? Is it scripturally based? Or is it my opinion? Is it my bias? Is it what James was talking about earlier, that I'm bringing a wisdom that's envious or competitive, or that I'm trying to put you in your place because of a particular position that I hold, and that the message itself is going to be dampened because my heart's not right? And so you can see where all three of these, motivation, method, and message, are very mixed together. And so when we do this admonishment, when we come together and deliver these words of caution, it's not just as easy as you speaking your mind. It's what we've all had to learn. You know, it's been how many years of marriage now? 33, 34 years of marriage, something like that, a long time. <laughs> but we've all had to learn this in our marriages, right? It's not just enough to just say what I think. And I'm not saying we've got to manipulate or we've got to coerce. I'm just saying we have to be understanding of our, where our attitudes are and we've got to be planned in how we bring that because if we want true and lasting change in any of our relationships, we've got to be mindful of motivation, method, and the message. Now, one final point that didn't start with an M, so I didn't want to include it, is a real key to this admonishment process is the receiver. If I'm the one that needs redirection, I play a very key role in this. And so if someone comes to me and says, hey, Kevin, I'd like to talk to you about something difficult. Do, do you have some time? I've got to start preparing my heart that there may be some things I'm about to hear that I'm going to have to respond to. Now, I'm not agreeing in that moment that I have to agree with it. Right? I haven't heard it yet. But I do think there's a responsibility, especially for those of us in the body of Christ, as we're working together for this common mission, that as we hear these difficult truths, that we're in a place of receiving it, that we give the person credit. We assume their motivations are right. We ask questions for clarifying. Hey, what I hear you saying is, and you repeat it back, that you're not defensive, that you're not interrupting, that you're open to what's being talked about. Because I can tell you, I have, in many situations, I believe, as best I could, done my homework on the motivation method and message, and have gone to someone, and there was no way they wanted to hear it from me. They just weren't going to hear it. It felt like criticism to them. They weren't up for the change. And so I had done what I felt like I needed to do, but their position in that was that they weren't up for the feedback. Now, what does that do for future potential conversations? It makes me a whole lot less likely to do that. 
So if I'm the receiver of an admonishment, I want us to, to be careful to take the humble road, take the courageous road, and give yourself time to process that and, and, re, and realize that hopefully, if it's clear in that conversation, that person's intent is for love and that we don't have to give them an answer at that, right, at that point. It might be, and don't just say it to be, to be flip, I need to pray and think about this and can we come back together and talk about it again? That's very different than, I don't believe you. <laughs> I don't appreciate what you've just said, and I think you're wrong about me, right? That means I'll never get the healthy benefit of an admonishment and a warning again. And so I think there's a fourth element to this. It really is about me receiving it. Well, before we head out, I want to I offer up a, a, another perspective on admonishment that gets us outside of the human-to-human -human relationship. And I'll just be honest with you. I, I think of all the admonishments that I've gotten in my life, certainly in my time of Jesus, most of them have not come from another person. Most of the admonishment that I've received have come in two ways that are really the same. One is God's word. <laughs> As I read God's word and I'm open to what it's teaching me, I can't help but measure it against my life and say, oh, Kevin, you've got to change. There's a part of how you're living life that isn't aligning with God's word, and so it needs to be directed. And so there is this more permanent admonishment that the scripture has held to us and anchored into it, but there's also these real-time admonishments that I receive as a benefit of having the Holy Spirit being an indwelling presence in my life. Nona's has talked several times when we, uh, when, we, uh, uh, when we counsel premarital couples or we talk with uh, other couples that are in maybe marriage difficulty about this process of criticism between couples or change between couples. And she shares that oftentimes that there's, there, there's something she's noticing in me that needs change, something that's gone awry, maybe an attitude I've picked up. Uh, and oftentimes she's looking for that on-ramp, and I'm not, giving a, I'm not doing a good job of providing that on-ramp. Uh, and so the Holy Spirit will ask her to just rest and hold on as he begins to speak to me. And in those times, the Holy Spirit would reveal it, and I would go to her and say, you know, I'm sorry about this, or it may not have anything to do with knowing at all. It's just something she sees in me in other relationships, and the Holy Spirit has awakened to me in something that needed to change. But the reality is, my spiritual condition, my openness to the Spirit, is very much a part about whether the Spirit's going to be able to break through and speak to me at that time. But, but I offer this up as kind of our exiting point, because I think that the first thing we ought to do as followers of Jesus is take advantage of it. It is the role of the Holy Spirit. It is the benefit of God dwelling inside of you and I at the point of salvation and the Spirit continually filling me and baptizing me, not with just his awakening, hey, Kevin, you need to redirect, but also the power to redirect. It's what Jesus was talking about in, in, in John 14 as he's telling his disciples, hey, my physical presence is about to end. I'm about to leave you. But I must leave because I'm going to give you something you haven't had in the way you're about to get it. And this thing is going to do the things I just asked you to do. He had just asked him, hey, if you love me, obey my commands. And he says this about the Holy Spirit. All this I've spoken while still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. So my point to you this morning as we head into a time of communion and we head into a time of personal ministry is I want us to also consider that Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit. If you're a follower of Jesus today, that Spirit resides in you. Now, whether he's speaking truth into you is about whether or not you've surrendered to that. And what I'm going to pray for us right now is that the Holy Spirit would be active in each one of our hearts and in every one of our relationship as that redirection comes, whether it comes from directly from the Holy Spirit or through the, someone that God has blessed us with to bring us that admonishment, that the end would be change and that change would draw us closer to Christ as a result of it. Let's pray for that. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your word. God, thank you that you, you've given us this, this anchoring of truth that is so relevant and so just point on to the relationships in our life, the plans that we have, the plans you have for us. God, I pray that the, the truth of what, your, of what your scriptures revealed to us today would take root, that we would grow in a, a deeper appreciation for the caution that we're to receive and the cautions we're to give each other. Because, Lord, it's not even just about the correction, Lord. It's about the transformative process of us becoming more like you. And we know that at those times, we need to change. 
Holy Spirit, I pray that you would begin to raise that value in all of us. I pray that, that, that you would baptize us in your spirit, that you would continually fill us with an awakening of not just the power and the presence of, of what you do in our life, but in the change that needs to come so that we can walk more fully in the plan and the purpose that you've given us. So Holy Spirit, we invite you here right now. We invite you to come and to speak your truth in this time, in this place, that you would lift up and encourage each one of us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.